all the way across. Um, you know, and, and so they own all of that, plus the right of way. I don't e recall the exact, what's a, what's a section? Uh, 600, 640 yeah, 640 acres, every, every other 640 acres on either side, all the way. Now, a lot, they've sold a lot of the land, but they've retained all mineral rights. The railroads have all mineral rights. Well, yeah, the, okay, the state, the state of, because I've taken too much time, but, uh, you know, there's a, a plate full of problems, a, a lot of them. Conrail is going to need far, far more assistance in the very near future. DOT is projected somewhere in the neighborhood of $16 billion in shortfall in capital investment for railroads over the next 10 years. There are going to be many more rail line abandonments, and as I mentioned before, the railroads are going to double, want to double railroad retirement uh, from government. That's government subsidy. Um, so... Let me just quote somebody. John Creedy, president of the Water Transport Association, in a speech before the Great Lakes Commission last summer, said, the idea of un using land-grant subsidies to moderate rail rates is so obvious that some people can't see it. They can see it all right where public subsidies are applied to other public services. For example, for 50 years, the federal government has been building hydro dams in the Pacific Northwest, and electricity rates there were lower as a result. Those who ride to work on mass transit uh, pay fares lower than average than they would otherwise because of subsidies. Those who enjoy a rural electric co-ops, of course, pay rates that are lower because of government subsidies. Uh, one could name dozens of other examples. A totally unjustified exception is the public lands given to railroads. Railroads rates are not lower than they would otherwise be because of the land grants. And he isn't the only guy. Congressman Williams of Montana introduced on September 10th a bill uh, that co is to repeal certain sections of the Mineral Lands Leasing Act. His bill would require that a minimum of one-third of the revenues from land-grant development be given to the railroads to, as a source of capital and operating income. Uh, it would also require that one-third of the revenues be returned from the energy subsidiaries to the railroad subsidiaries of the rail holding company. In his statement, Williams said, in the late um, 1800s, approximately 10 percent of the entire land mass of the U.S. was granted to various railroad companies by the federal and state governments. Today, he said, a century after most of the land grants were made, the transcontinental railroads are in decline, consolidations, mergers, takeovers, threaten even greater railroad monopolies, offering less and less service and higher and higher prices. The federal government has been too cautious in representing the legitimate public interest in demanding corporate responsibility from the descendants of the railroad robber barons. <laughs> so that's what he says. Okay. So to, to finish this off, there have been a lot of agriculture groups around the country in the past two months that have tried to take and have gotten involved in this thing. The National Council of Farmer Cooperatives has passed a resolution calling for a congressional inquiry into the land-grant question. And basically what they're trying to do, they're, they're saying, let's determine what the fair value of the remaining land assets are, and, and as well as the current income from those land-grant land assets. Determine to the extent to which the ICC should permit rail services to be abandoned in light of the government provided land grants. Establish a policy on diversions of land grant assets from the railroads and so on. This is what this congressional inquiry is supposed to look at. And, and the, the farmer co-op group is doing it. The National Associ Association of State Departments of Agriculture, all state agriculture commissioners are involved. They haven't passed a resolution yet, but they've got one pending. Uh, I know the Farmers Union has, uh, has gotten into the Union Pacific case, merger case, on this very issue. Even the Farm Bureau. My goodness, I couldn't believe it. You know, the Farm Bureau, which is the only thing I've ever heard them for is uh, insurance. <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't say it. I'm sorry. But, but the Farm Bureau came out last week with a very strong statement. I, I was, and they're the ones who were leading the fight for deregulation of railroads in the, in the, from the farm groups. The only group, the only farm group that was uh, in support of deregulation. Now they've come out with it. I've got an article here, if you want it, Jack, uh, that they wrote in their latest paper. Very, they were very disturbed that this coming monopoly power. So uh, there, there are a lot of people that are involved in it, and I and I urge, I urge that the NFO take a serious look at at uh, taking an official position on this issue. Uh, it's you know your professional people and 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 your professions are endangered by by some of these happenings, and I I think it's uh, it's important that you do this. And speaking, I'm going to finish up with this one last little comment. 
Uh, speaking of professionalism, I, I'm reminded of the three professionals that were over in Iran here not too long ago, the lawyer, a doctor, and an engineer. And uh, boy, they were grabbed up as soon as they set foot on the land and thrown in prison and, and charged with, uh, uh, with something, I can't remember what it was, but, uh, uh, and then they were brought to trial and were sentenced to death by the guillotine. And so they were pulled out and drug out to the guillotine and the first guy came up, the doctor, and they said, all right, do you want a sack over your head or do you want your face down, head up? And he said, no, no, I don't want a sack and I want my face up. And so they strapped them in, shut the thing down, and pulled the chain and the guillotine came down and stopped just above his neck. And they couldn't figure it out. It must have been an act of, of the Almighty or something. And so they let him go. They said it must have, been a, you know, must have meant something. So the, so the uh, doctor gets in there. Yeah, and the same thing. He says, no, I don't want anything. And so they pulled the chain, and the same thing happened. And so they let him go. And then the engineer gets in there, and they asked him the same question. He says, no, I don't want anything. Just put me in there. And they locked him in. And just as they were getting ready to pull the chain, he looked up, and he says, hold it. He says, I think I see your problem. <laughs> that's, well, that's the kind of professional dedication I want to see out of the NFO. I'm sure Ron has some time for some final questions here in a minute, but the point I, I would like to make here is we didn't need it, but we do have another reason to organize. How many of you remember the idea of pricing it at the farm gate and letting the buyer pay the freight? <laughs> right, right. Now more than ever, we have to look at that option. Why are we paying the freight? Why are we subsidizing the Soviet economy with cheap grain? Why are we doing those things? Because we haven't made the decision to organize. We have, but a lot have not. We must be strong enough to price the product at the farm gate and pass the user fees and the cost of transportation on to the buyer, on to the buyer. In the short run, we as NFOers need to inform our congressional delegations of our need to have a cost allocation study done on the user fees. Each of us can do that, and we can do that now. Uh, short of that, I guess Ron uh, will take questions if there are any.